If there's an 85 year old woman out there who knows who pegging is, I'm calling dips. <laughs> What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Open My Pain with Anthony and Wayne. As always, we are here with my buddy Anthony, but nobody gives a flying fuck because we have a much better, <laughs> a much better comedian, a friend of the show, uh, Mr. Jacques Lambert. Jacques, how are you? Well, first of all, Anthony, I give a fuck. I really do. Oh, you, you know, so so we'll we'll start with that. I mean, you're a piece of shit. Don't get me wrong, but I do give a fuck. So <laughs> so, so you see, that's playing both sides of the fence. That that's that's throwing a cupcake to each one of you. Um, I'm great, boys. I'm so super thrilled to truly be on one of my favorite podcasts. I sincerely mean this. This is so exciting for me. Woo! Happy to have you, Jacques. And and Anthony. I know. I know everything out of my mouth sounds sarcastic. No. Oh, it's so great to be here. But I truly, <laughs> since you guys have started recording and started putting it out, uh, it's almost like a public service. I, I say it to everybody I can. I, I work to get more people listening to you guys than mine because what you guys are doing, it actually has a purpose and a function inside the community of comedy. So before we go too far, um, because I had this all planned out in my head, the way I was going to introduce you based off of our uh, class last week, I was going to bring up your podcast, Where You've Been. So you've performed at the Comedy Store in L.A., you've been at Tao Comedy, you've been to all other kinds of other places I don't even know in California, and you have your own podcast, Carnival Personnel. Um, and I said none of that. So Mike Atrobus, I am fucking sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but you have all that stuff. And before we go there, Anthony, are you doing okay? Are you good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm good. But first of all, I'm not gonna fucking take shit from somebody that can't even line up a banner right behind him, wearing his own fucking merch on his goddamn body, one headphone in his stupid ears, <laughs> beard looks like somebody put a screen in front of him and Jock farted through it. And that's where the fucking yep. facial hair landed. <laughs> Yep. And that motherfucker's <laughs> telling me about that. Yep. God damn, everybody. Wayne well, can w- suck my again, dick. Once again, I edit all this shit. This banner means nothing. It'll look good. <laughs> oh, no. oh, my God. I, That's I what he took out of that. That's the one thing I, he took out of that. He's like, the banner shouldn't be that crooked when I finish. <laughs> I, I walked into American. my I, I walked into my house. Three or four years ago, I, I, I did a quick errand to, to the supermarket, and I walked in, and my wife's like, where, did, where are you coming from? I'm like, I just ran to the store. And she looks at me, and she pauses, and she's like, oh, you just gave up, and walked away based, <laughs> based on what I was wearing. Like, And this is pre-pandemic, and, you know, and uh, pajama bottoms, a ripped Star Wars shirt, like that my hair is just looking like it normally is. Yeah, and I don't. Like, uh, when we do, when I usually do the podcast, we do it on another platform, and I have a background, so it's a brick wall, so it looks like a comedian, like, standing in front of a brick wall. But on this, there's nothing. And no, I have, uh, Wayne, the only thing Thing. Remember, and I won't. When Joe told me we had a guest who wouldn't wrap it up one day, <laughs> oh, and, yes. and he and he handed me that note. He handed me that note, and I put it on the wall behind me. Uh, no, you know the, the, the wall behind me. It's like uh, uh, in the Simpsons, they do an episode where they rebuild uh, uh, the the neighbor's house, and somebody goes to take a poster down, and Bart's like, "No, no, that's a load bearing poster." Like. <laughs> <laughs> like the walls in my office, uh, we bought this house in 2017 and the bank had owned it a few years before that. When I say they did the bare minimum to get it up to code, it's like you cannot, you cannot put anything more than a post it note on this wall. Otherwise, it will crumble. Like absolutely <laughs> fucking absolutely crumble. But, uh, but no. And, 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 and then, you know, Anthony, it's true. I am the worst with self promotion. Like, like I literally spend half of our podcast suggesting other podcasts I like more. You know? It's true. I'm a huge fan, and it's true. He does that. <laughs> you know, oh. right, so did you tell so, that whole story about your wife just perfectly uh, to tell you that you've given up on life because it's a perfect dichotomy to how Wayne has given up on this podcast by how he's presenting himself right now? Is that why you said that? <laughs> 
No, look at he's got he's got the poster, he's got the shirt. Um, uh, I mean, he's really uh, rocking the. Oh, look at that! That's no, a no. trifecta. No, no, that's no, a no. hat trick of branding. Exactly. That's a that's a hat trick of branding. You know right what there. that is? I you will tell you, you know what that best? is. That's like so no. the equivalent to this podcast, and uh, like it'd be like if you found your wife in bed with another guy, and you're like, oh god, this is going go poorly. on. <laughs> this is going poorly. <laughs> So you're like, all right, there's two choices. I can either be a man and stand up for myself and uh, beat the shit out of the guy, or I can be the biggest, put on her jewelry, and put, fucking wear her dresses for her, do whatever it takes to be a giant bitch. And I think that's what, more where Wayne's leaning. Are you saying that it's being a bitch wearing our, our stuff? Because I'm going to say you have a hat, you have a shirt, you yeah. haven't worn them once that I know of. Well, first of all, they so, smelled like a dead body rolled in vinegar, so I had to wash the shirts. I don't first, give a flying And fuck. you wore them in public. <laughs> I, I, I told my wife, so my um, Wayne gave me the shirt, and my wife went, oh my god, this thing smells gross, i got to wash it. And I went, Wayne wore that, and she gagged. She went, oh. She went, a person wore this with a body? I went, yeah, they sure fucking did. I, I was proud it. of it. <laughs> so <laughs> so a, a little while ago, my wife was in, in Chicago for work. She got invited to this weird museum, this tiny museum. And it's at some guy's house. Like, you got to email the guy and get an invite to come to this museum. And on the way there, you know, it was a friend... Depeche Mode was playing in Chicago while she was there working, and a friend from the Duran Duran fan group says, hey, I'm coming to Chicago. Do you want to get together? I'm going to this museum. My wife, on the way on the Uber, calls me and says, I'm going to take a picture of the house and what I'm wearing <laughs> if you don't hear from me in an hour, because it seemed a little weird <laughs> that this guy has this museum. She goes into the museum. It turns out that the guy was the drummer in the band Public Image Limited, Johnny Rotten's band after the Sex Pistols. And then he left that band after five years to be the drummer in Nine Inch Nails and then went on to drum for ministry. And he started in his house like five years ago, the Museum of Post-Punk and industrial and it's a real museum it's 2500 square feet it's all paraphernalia from all those bands all that era and he comes on the podcast and it's funny because uh it turns out when we lived in venice two doors down was johnny rotten and i was telling this story how johnny rotten always walked around the neighborhood wearing his own swag much like wayne <laughs> and 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 the guy you know the guy martin Martin Atkins. Uh, Martin's like, you know why he wears the swag? I'm like, well, I, he's just shameless self-promotion. And he's like, no. He is the cheapest person I've ever met in my life. And if there's a box left over from a tour, he will literally wear that until it has to be washed. And then there's another tour. And then he'll just wear the T-shirts from that it's absolutely just the fact that he is that cheap and lazy which i thought okay. made it even more endearing that which I, right. made me love him more <laughs> i yeah. like that you know tom brady he did an interview right before he got drafted by the patriots when he was in college and they were like when you make it big what will you do and they asked his roommate and his roommate was like i'm gonna buy my mom a house uh i'm gonna buy my sister a car uh, i'm gonna put my brother through college and they went to Tom Brady, and he was like, I'm going to buy enough socks so I can wear one pair of socks every day and then throw it away into the trash and then get a new pair of socks because I feel like that would be nice, fresh pair of socks every day. And uh, that has been my dream my whole life is just to have unlimited I have socks. To do that. <laughs> I have yeah. to do that because my dogs eat my socks. Oh, so so <laughs> there's, oh there's, only one, there's only one comic – that we with it, you guys that we're we're in this little group with uh Con Con Connor Ferguson who okay. wears as much who wears as much superhero shit as I do, the plot and you guys might get this the plot to Superman three uh, that starred uh um uh, oh god Richard Pryor. The evil guy in it, when he first meets Richard Pryor, tells him exactly that. That he's so rich, he's never worn the same pair of socks twice. <laughs> and Richard Pryor is just like, no one's that rich. <laughs> no, yeah. no one. No one. You, you know, and, and, and there is. There's few things in the world that make me happier that on Christmas, when I get my own Christmas gifts and it's a new pack of socks, putting on new socks. It's like, wow. It's like, okay, you can have sex with these, you know, the, the, this 
this 32 year old woman. Okay, two 16 year olds tied together, but if you do the math, it's the same thing. <laughs> or you can have fresh socks, dude. No hesitation. Like, like I will take fresh socks absolutely every single day. There's no better feeling. There isn't. There isn't. And I've had sex with two 16 year olds tied together. So now, at the time, at the time, I was 15. You know. I was about to say, sounds like a Russell but, uh, Saturday night. God damn. <laughs> Where are the bodies, Wayne? Oh, man. <laughs> All right, did you hear that, Haynes? So Jacques, Will I... you fucking support this podcast now? <laughs> Sponsor us, Haynes. I think my shirt actually might be a Haynes. Yeah, I can tell. I can tell by its uh, by its quality. Well, just look at the one that you have that you've never worn. Uh, uh, yeah, fuck. yeah, well, first so I need to send it to forensics to make sure no bodies were involved in it, and then I can wear it. Piece of shit. Jesus. <laughs> Go ahead. Ask Jacques so a question <clears throat> all with a terrible segue. You're so bad at segues. Sorry. <laughs> Did you know the guy I, I, who I invented? Do you know the guy who invented the Segway died riding a Segway off a cliff? And that's a true Steve story. Wozniak invented the Segway. Was it? Was he one of the partners or something? He, he was an investor. He was an uh, early investor. Damn, that's awesome. Mm. That's how I want to go. Yeah. Oh, it's so hot, right? Yeah. Seriously. <laughs> so, Jacques, uh, we have a lot of topics to hit today, but before we get too far, I want to ask you about your your start in comedy. Um, having listened to your podcast, uh, I know that you started about what thirty years ago. So when, I, when I was just <laughs> pro- possibly just swimming around a ball sack myself, you were uh, standing up on stage. I um, I'll try to make it really condensed. I had coming out of film school, I had two syndicated, and now granted, syndicated on cable access stations, but to thirty two different um um. Uh, municipalities, you know, like it uh, uh, yeah. that would serve three or four towns that would go from southern Maine down to northern Pennsylvania uh, out to like the Adirondacks, Utica, you know, uh, Rochester. And one was I had a music video show that I met my co- podcast partner who was two episodes into a sketch comedy show with a couple buddies. I'm the guy who ran the station. Uh, you know, I- I'm directing music videos for Boston bands and bands out of New York. I'm a year out of film school. And I had a music video show that was, like I said, th- th- there was a charting service. I was a reporter on it, uh, you know, to the charting things. It was all self-serving just so I could play my own band videos and get chart numbers. The guy says, can you help these kids do a sketch show? Right away, I meet Joe. And it's creepy because I'm 24. He's like 17 at the time. And we become best friends. Joe was 17 going on like 80. He was born old. <sighs> you know, he, and, 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 it's it's funny you say that because the the vibe I get from Joe is that he's 236. Right. Like there's a, there's a there's a great line that we always reference from <laughs> It's a Wonderful Life where George Bailey's father says you were born older. <laughs> and and so Joe That's perfect. Joe and I start doing this sketch show. Um I end up getting I end up going out to LA for a band thing and I end up coming back and I, I <laughs> A friend of mine was friends with this family in L.A., and I don't know anybody in L.A. except my rocket scientist brother who works for JPL. And so I'm staying with my my you know half brother in Pasadena, and uh, a friend back here says, "Oh, when you get out there, I want you to hang out with this buddy of mine. You know, I'm friends with his parents, but this kid, you're both in bands, you both live for hockey. I'm I'm two years." I'm two years out of minor league hockey. He goes, you, you both live for hockey. You're both in bands. You're both fucked up. You're going to get along. So he gives him, you know, you know, my buddy's number who I'm staying with. He gives me his number. There's pre cell phones. This is at 95. And I call this kid and he's doing me a favor. He's like, fine. My friend Dennis is friends. And I don't know who the fuck he is. I don't know who the fuck anybody is, but it turns out he's an actor and he's kind of a big actor and he's on the show called Party of Five. And so he hangs out with me. He comes to Pasadena, picks me up. We, we just have a great couple, you know, a, a great day. He's like, Hey, I'm going to rent this rink tomorrow night because he's not allowed to play. 
a lot of these a lot of these actors have it in their contract they can't do stupid things like you mm -hmm. you can't bust your nose you can't lose a tooth and show up the next day so you're you're contractually obligated not to do certain things and so he would routinely rent the rig at like one two o'clock in the morning and it'd be him and a few actors i'm like dude i don't have any fucking equipment so he goes don't worry uh just we'll get you some equipment well, you know, it's fine. The equipment is the equipment. It's a it's a player in the equipment, not the equipment the players in. So we end up playing. They're they're impressed, which they shouldn't be, because they're 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 guys who play pickup hockey. You know what I mean? It's like they're it's fine. And he says, "Look, I got an extra room. If you move out here, you can just live with me." And at the same time, we got a little money from a label that says, "Hey." Why don't you guys come out here, record a couple things, and let's see how it goes. Um, I come back. Uh, first of all, when, when I got there, I had never been in L.A. Um, I never thought about moving to L.A. It took about 14 seconds to me to realize that's home. Like, like it was just the weird – I've always been a, been a square peg in a round hole back here. I've never fit in uh, most places. I still don't. It Anthony was a lot about pegging. Yeah, you know, hey, you know, uh, <laughs> I'm trying not to, uh, but yeah. So <laughs> you raise your hands for that joke? Sorry, Jock. Hold on one second. God damn, this is a comedy podcast, Wayne. Don't act like we're fucking on some kind of zoo podcast with an 85 year old safari lady looking at rhinos or some shit where that joke's gonna fly as high level. Get your shit together, dude. God damn, that's what you raise your hands about. Fuck you. Sorry, go, Jock. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just going to make this fucking crystal clear. If there's an 85 year old woman out there who knows who pegging is, I'm calling dips because she's because because first of all, I, I mean, if she knows what pegging is, she's seen a fucking thing or two. The you dildo know, has a tennis ball at the end of it, <laughs> right? Did, did I not hear you call dibs on Doris last night? Yes, I did. Oh well. <laughs> We saw Anthony. There was a seventy-five-year-old comedian, and she was fun. She really was fun. But it's it's a running thing. Like I, I started doing that around Joe like twenty years ago. If we're out in public and a really old lady in a walker comes by, I just look at him and I say dibs always, I, I, every single time. You know, but but I go to L.A. and again. I don't know anybody. And this guy says, if you play on my celebrity hockey team, um, just move out here. I'll get you hooked up. There was a tiny post house that had a deal with the UHF channel that said, oh, well, if you come and do operations manager stuff during the day, you can use our edit system at night and we can get your show on this UPN channel. Um, and so, it, you know, UPS channel, it was uh, KCOP, WKCOP, Channel 13, Los Angeles. So I come home. I, I, I buy a $2,000 van, $2,500 van. Something bad happens and the, and the guys in the band can't make the trip with me. I kind of stick around an extra month and then it, circumstances forced my hand. I had to go. Like, like a life thing came up. It was really awful. Uh, but I, it was time for me to go. I went out there. I don't know fucking anybody except these people on the show party of five and three of them were on this hockey team. And the second year I'm out there, the kid who was on Party 5 is still on Party 5, but he also ended up doing a show with Sherman Helmsley on another station that was a sitcom. And so he's on two shows at once, and he's, well, right now he's on two shows. And I all of a sudden am hanging out on sets all the time. And another kid from the team ends up going from Party of 5 to the show Sybil, which is a sitcom. I'm, I'm, I have, I'm looking at this thinking, man, I have all these opportunities to have an end doing acting. I can't take acting classes. I can't afford that. But I realize that most of the people here acting, it's 90% confidence. It's just 90% confidence. So I, I run the matrix in my head and I'm like, oh. I'll just start doing stand-up, because if you can do stand and first of all, everybody's telling me I'm funny. Joe and I had the sketch comedy show that did well. It got picked up. The, the, you know, um, I'm out there producing the sketch comedy show. That's my thing. I live for sketch comedy. Um, and so I'm like, okay, I'm just going to start doing stand-up. I've always loved stand-up. I, I, I just 
I'm a, I'm a comedy historian. Uh, you know, I go to bed at night listening to 1930, you know, radio shows, not just the Jack Benny shows, but sitcoms from the 30s and 40s. I absolutely love that shit. And like the Hindenburg. <laughs> There's a uh, 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 oh what what is it uh, uh, Remley Phil Remley show and stuff like that and and it's funny there's this radio sitcom uh, Jack Benny's band leader gets his own sitcom and it's a spinoff sitcom and it's uh, buffoon husband with the wife more than attractive than he could ever get in real life for the smart mouth kids and it's every show that's on ABC this fall <laughs> like like yeah. it's literally. It's, it's it's if you if you go back and listen to that the you know the Phil uh, that show uh, the Phil Remley show it it literally could be on 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 um, the CW this fall anyway so I start doing stand up and uh, I do okay and I start doing it at places like the Ice House um, and Laugh Factory and then another life changing event came along that was. A good thing. Well, Joe moved out. Like Joe ended up moving out. We do the sitcom. Uh, we get a bunch of writing offers. We get a bunch of offers to do something with the show. Uh, we got offers from SNL to buy a couple of our characters, which was great, but kind of pissed me off because they wanted to license. They wanted to license two characters and they wanted to buy two sketches, and but they didn't want to hire us. <laughs> It's like it was it was really, really um uh, luckily I had a good lawyer and Yeah, no, I I was just about to say like that, that is probably the best thing because you, you, I mean I don't know if you have all that stuff archived, but have you watched um Oh god, what's the show with uh Tim Robinson? I think you should leave. Right. Have you watched that? I have not. You have to watch that. Jacques, before I see you next time, you need okay. to watch that. That is a sketch comedy show where Tim Robinson was a writer on SNL, and that is all uh, mostly sketches that he that, that were rejected by SNL, and it's one of the funniest shows I've ever oh, seen in my life. That's so great. That it, you know that that is it, you, my my funniest SNL story that in recent years is when John Mulaney was a writer, he kept pitching this skit about a musical and a diner that sold lobster. And he pitched that <laughs> he pitched that skit like ten times, and Seth Meyers was the head writer at the time, and always said no. And the last time John Mulaney hosted it, they did that skit. And about two weeks later, John Mulaney's on Seth Meyers, and he just sits down, and neither one of them says anything, and he's like. So you finally got your lobster skin. <laughs> and it was just, and it was just absolutely, you know, delicious. No, I will watch, but, but, uh, circumstance, you know, light, light, life threw a couple curveballs. Uh, Joe, uh, had to move back east. And at the same time, it was a good situation, but my life changed dramatically because I ended up, uh, my kids have no idea about this. Um, my wife and I joke about it all the time. My kids have no idea that both my wife and I were married, like w when we were younger. Huh. And my and my first wife was a pro hockey player, and I ended up splitting my time between Vancouver and Los Angeles, where I helped run the NWHL. Uh, the Vancouver Griffins was the team, and I basically had to give up everything for about a four or five year window because every other weekend I was either in Vancouver or Calgary or Edmonton or Toronto. Um, Talk about pegging. With the team. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> so that's a pegging joke, Liz. <laughs> no, there was a scene. No, it's not. What? Fuck yourself. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, how was it, Jack, that every time I talk to you, I learn something like more interesting about you than the last time I talked to you? So you guys and we know, talk every day. You know my, <laughs> you know the bit I have about how I have the Hello Kitty tattoo and why? Mm. Because I talk about how this girlfriend at the time was just joking that I have these tattoos with other victims, with other, you know, people before her, and I must have loved them more. So the ex-wife, I will never be able to forget our anniversary because Instead of getting engagement rings, we got our favorite player's numbers tattooed to our feet. So I have Bobby Orr's number four on my left foot, Wayne Gretzky's 99 on my right foot. She got Claude Lemieux's 22 on her foot. So we got married 422-99 of the week we met. 
Um, the women wore the home, the men wore the away uniforms of the Charlestown Chiefs from Slapshot, and it was ESPN's play of the day. Um, it was covered by two LA news stations, and ESPN picked it up as the play of the day. Um, and so, yeah, that's what I'd say. And then, and about two, three years later, Ashton Kutcher was hosting Saturday Night Live. At the time, I did not know my wife. Like, but, but, it was Ashton hosted Saturday Night Live about two months, three months after my wife and I had split. And I was flying. I flew home to pick up my brother to take him to SNL because Ashton was hosting. And we ended up meeting another friend there and uh, in New York. And and my wife always hates the story because she was dying to go. And she, she was a friend of my sister's. And she was like, you got to you got to. Tell your brother, take me. You got to tell your brother, take me. Well, I wasn't going to take one of my sister's friends because I had another friend in New York I was going to be seeing that day. <laughs> uh, my, my brother and I get down to New York about two in the afternoon. We go to the ESPN Sports Zone. I, I don't drink anymore. Like, like Wayne saw me have about a half a beer last night was probably, and Joe was even giving me a hard time. It's three quarters of your last. <laughs> right. And that was the most Joe has seen me drink, but I used to drink. And so, this this friend this this friend and and her husband at the time like you know come down to New York, uh, come into the city. They lived in Long Island, and they get there around eight. And my brother and I are too drunk to go to SNL. We are like too hammered, so we keep drinking. We're gonna go to the after party because I'm friends with. Long story short, I end up being in the mix with the that 70s show um since this since the day it started i was there for the first audition and for the last taping wow. uh for that 70s show yeah and, and so I and i pulled most of the sketches down and dude it's the greatest and, and it's like my when my wife when the when my wife ended up moving out it was her favorite thing because on friday night they taped so i would go to the taping for the first two or three hours and then leave because i played hockey every friday night but she would sit right there on the stage with whoever the guest star was was so she got to meet absolutely everybody and you know one of my best friends was the star of the show and it, there's still a couple clips because when joe's son who's now 23 was old enough to start getting on youtube himself we pulled most of the clips down but if you google in the crease tv all one word and the crease tv there's a bunch of skits still up there and there's a bunch of skits with ashton and mila because they used to come and do our sketch show or we would go down to the set and in between takes and just hanging out we would shoot skits that we would use on our show my my show with joe so i end up and i so i end up Go into the after party, and I bring this girl and her husband and my brother, and we stay till whatever. Uh, my brother and I walk back to the car. We sleep for a few hours, like two or three hours, but we have tickets to see the Red Sox. It's a one o'clock game. We're about an hour into the drive, and my arm fucking hurts. It really hurts. And, and I keep like flexing my arm and stretching it. My brother's, what's the matter? I'm like, my arm hurts. And my brother, like only a brother would or could says this arm and he punches my shoulder hmm. and I screamed and I'm like, fuck. And he starts laughing. He goes, you don't know. <laughs> I pull over. I take my shirt off. I got a tattoo at one point. <laughs> not remembering at all not remembering at all and it's it, it, and it's and the thing is it kind of didn't take because my my i had so much alcohol in me it's supposed to be solid black <laughs> but you see how it's all marbled it's because it didn't take and my is arm a is symbol? yeah yeah and then i got this one about two years <laughs> later the batman superman one um there you go and so I didn't even remember getting the tattoo. So when my wife, at the time, my girlfriend in Venice is saying, well, this girl who I used to hook up with, I got a tattoo in New York and I don't even remember getting it. My ex-wife, I got tattoos. So I must have loved them more. And the bit that I talk about that I just pulled the car over and walked in and got a Hello Kitty tattoo, that's exactly how it went down. Not, not one bit of an exaggeration. I pulled the car over, coincidentally in front of a tattoo shop. Fun fact, wherever you pull a car over, over in Venice, California, you pull over in front of a tattoo shop. I walked in. The guy says, what are we going to do? I hiked up her skirt and I said, I want that exact tattoo that she has on her upper 
right thigh on my upper left thigh because I slept on that side, and that way the kitties can snuggle at night. I got the Hello Kitty tattoo. <laughs> I, I literally, I got the tattoo on my leg. I walked out, and I just said, you no longer, you have lost the privilege of ever saying I've ever loved anybody more because, yeah, Hockey tattoos with one girl who's a pro hockey player. Batman tattoo with a girl who's a Batman freak. And But now I have a Hello Kitty tattoo on my hip, which every guy I play hockey with the rest of my life will see it. And, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and at the time, I was still playing in a band, and I would play naked all the time. So I'm like, yeah, people are going to see this a lot. And they did. Um but yeah, so 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 that so that's that story is one hundred percent true about how I have a crazy tattoo. And then for my wedding ring, I ended up getting uh, the Green Lantern tattoo because I won't wear jewelry. I, I've noticed that. Yeah, I can't wear jewelry. Well, I can wear jewelry, but the last time I had a wedding ring, I was in a fight, and I <laughs> and I broke my knuckle, and I ended up having to cut the ring off because it was cutting off the circulation uh, from the broken yeah. knuckle. So. Yeah, because I still fight because I'm an idiot. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I like it. Well, so everybody at home, if you were thinking, how can I have a path to comedy, and you think there isn't one, you have to like do a bunch of weird things and have circumstances happen to you? It's not true. Just listen to his truck and do exactly what he did. Go out to California, yeah, no. <laughs> find a female professional hockey player, cut off a ring off your finger from punching a man in yep. the face repeatedly and breaking your well, own hand on his face. <laughs> well, I, I, I thank you. you I Rajakis. thank you. I thank you for assuming that I punched a guy. I, I do. I, I, you know, I, you know, I, 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 you know, I, 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 was so, it the so two thank, 16 thank year olds? That's how it was. Oh, no, but, but, uh, but no, and I did. I started doing comedy just because I couldn't afford acting classes. And I'm like, if I can do this, if I can do this, and then I, and I ended up becoming friends with a guy who worked at the comedy store in Irvine. And so I would go to see everybody. I would literally go see. I don't like to meet people. I don't care about meeting people. The fact that I've got to meet and, and work with just like literally hundreds of, of, of stars. I think I got that opportunity. And I still do because I don't give a fuck. I treat everybody like the piece of shit they are. Um but that's anthony's motto right no and the one guy i didn't want to meet that i didn't meet was brian regan uh, love him right but i didn't want to meet him and find out he's a dick and he wasn't he was a fucking sweetheart and i met him I'm, four or five times i'm gonna tell you right now i can die happy knowing that because he i love that guy so much you know, and, and and they say that the old thing about you know you just absolutely love the Red Sox, and then you meet Ted Williams when you're a kid, and he's a dick to you, or Carl Ustrimsky is a dick to you. You're like, oh well, there goes the few happy moments I had in my childhood between Dad's yeah. beatings. But uh, <laughs> was that out loud? Sorry. Oh my um, god, I got like a tear in my eye when you said that. I went back in time. <laughs> you're like the Papa, Italian no. Native American from the nineties. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, you know, you only hurt the ones you're. You love is what my dad told me but during the beatings. Um, my I'm like, well, then love my that. brother. <laughs> love my brother. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but he couldn't take a punch. Um, no, my dad but, but yeah, no, so, me like Apocalypto. That's what it sounded like for me. Oh! <laughs> My little guy is Italian. my little guy is trying to learn Portuguese now. Oh, is he? Like right now, he's in the other. Yeah, his three best friends, you know, are all from Brazil. He's actually the, the kid. The kid he's playing with right now, they're at the sports center, uh, playing playing football with his older brother, and it's all Portuguese. So he's like, he knows the swears. He knows when somebody's telling him he's slow. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, to be fair, Portuguese is just slow Spanish. Which doesn't help me, but it. Uh, but when my wife met the, his friend's mom, they were able to speak Spanish together. So my wife can speak a little Spanish, you know. His mom speaks some Spanish, so they were able to communicate like that. You know, I just communicate by the with the dad by rolling her eyes and shoulders with the international sign of yeah, I don't fucking care what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> I right, just tell your son to grow some grapes and hit his wife, and he'll be a Portuguese in no time. <laughs> Yeah, no fuck. <laughs> so, so Jacques, uh, I heard you. Uh, so, so, like I said, I was I've been listening to uh, since we met Steve York. I met Steve York last night. Um, you had him on your podcast a little bit before 
uh, I found out about your podcast. So I'm, I'm, I don't want to say I'm going to steal a question because this is one that we ask all of our guests so far. It, do you remember the first joke or some of the first jokes you told and do you still do them? One hundred percent. Well, it's it's that's what a great question. Um, I just Thanks. found. <laughs> I, I just found. I had a I had a take out of storage. I was looking for something, and I found a folder from when I was doing stand up. And it's funny because I ended up telling a couple people at you know at the safe one night um, who we're all friends with. I'm like, oh my god, I just found this folder. I'm going to do a bunch of jokes from back then. And a lot of them, a lot of them are, you know, stood up. Um, and, and one of the, one of the big jokes is not the big jokes. I started by saying, Hey, I'm trying to work on, on, on audience participation. I'm not good at it, but can you guys give me a hand with this? And then I do the, give me an S, give me an H, give me an E, give me another E. Give me a P. And then I pause. People realize I got them to spell sheep. And then I just move on and don't address it. That's like the first joke I told. Um, but I told, and the funny thing is, and again, we're mentioning Colin Ferguson. I have to find my tape from the Ice House. Because when I started comedy, I was so scared to go up there. I went up with a guitar. And I would go, I would go up with a guitar case. I would put the guitar case down. I take out the guitar. I would awkwardly start tuning it and then tell a joke and then start tuning the guitar and then tell a joke. And then at the end of my set, I would put the guitar in the case and walk away, never playing it. Oh, yeah. Connor and and did then that to say if I did see that. Yeah. Yeah. He did that with a, that and a harmonica. And and he the first time I saw him do that, it, it, we, so we were at Donahue's together on a Sunday. He walked in and I was dying. Like mm. it absolute because you guys just have so either Connor has a time machine that got up to eighty eight miles per hour because if he gets eighty eight miles per hour <laughs> you're gonna see some shit. Uh, he went to the ice house in nineteen eighty seven and stole my bit or parallel thinking. <laughs> you know, I think yeah. I think obviously the more obvious thing, of course, he has a time machine. Yep. Um, <laughs> yeah, no shit. <laughs> and, but I, I was I was so scared when I went up. I had to have something in front of me. You know, I I, I, I I've been on stage five hundred times before that as a drummer, and I'm hiding behind a drum set, which is hiding behind a guitarist and bass player, and and that's completely different than standing up there like the raw nerve exposed. And that's why when we see kids like um like uh, Owen, who's been hanging out for the last couple of years, yep. up there at 17. Uh, there was another kid, oh, uh, Sawyer, a kid named Sawyer, who's been hanging around the safe. And he's a sweet kid. And he's like 17, 18. And now he just went off to school in Pennsylvania. Um, dude, it's like, it's like at 15, 16, 16, and 17, I had so much bravado and, and just all this confidence. You know, I, I did a lot of cool things. But not fucking stand up comedy in front of a bunch of drunken adults, you know. Uh, though, th so, so that was my first time. It's like, and, uh, and I do. I remember the first time I'm living in Pasadena, and I look at the LA Weekly, and there's a place in Burbank, and I went down and I signed up, and I was like the fifth, sixth, seventh person to go up, and I did it, and it was. I, I just remember shaking the whole time and just absolutely, absolutely shaking the whole time. And of course, there's no way to record it. You know what I mean? It's like there was no iPhones, no digital recorders. You know what I mean? I, I maybe I could have had like a a boombox. I could have walked walked in with a boombox and and, and a Cassia, uh, you know, and, and and put that down. But I do. I remember that day. I remember you know just trying to go through the notebook of like what I was going to do that day. Um, and, and, and just in my head, in my head, I just remember thinking the comedians I liked that I, w I wanted to sound like without sounding like I was doing an impression. Mm. Like, you know, how do you, how do you sound like Norm MacDonald without, you know, sounding like Norm MacDonald, you know, type thing. But, uh, but yeah, no, it was great. And then, uh, and then I didn't do it until last October. Well, God 
Damn. That is really cool. So all the way down, you stop there, you come back in October, and then now how often are you doing it? Before I left for L.A., two to three times a week. Two or three times a week. And then Mm -hmm. I would do it two or three times a week, and sometimes, about once a week, I was able to do two mics. Like, I was able to do two mics... uh, you know, on a Tuesday night, I, you know, if, if coffee and cotton and then up to, um, and then up to strange brew, or there was a, there's a mic at, in the afternoon at one Broadway and then over to Donahue's. So I was probably going out two to three times a week, but averaging four mics, nice. you know, uh, but then Zooms, you know, I have a couple friends who are writers and who I've, uh, you know, and I would do Zoom, not Zoom shows with, but pitch jokes and work things out, you know. Um, but, you know, before I started over the pandemic, I had a group for about a few months, which is like four or five people who are like real writers who, what on their tax forms, you know, they're writers and have done things. And we were doing uh, a, a Zoom twice a week, just pitching sets and um and and pitching jokes back and forth and punching each other's jokes up and it was a lot of fun it was it was it was a lot of fun so and and now that's what I'm kind of back to doing now just because you know because of things have changed in my life where I can only get out once a week mm. maybe twice maybe twice a week but at the same time um I just I just moved on to a different phase where I'm focusing on different aspects right now that I need to prioritize as far as, you know, doing this glorified hobby. And and that's, and so my focus has changed uh, for this latest phase. It makes sense. Yeah. Me and Wayne just did our most recent four month checkup video and we were pretty much religiously doing once a week at that point um, up to, to there. And since then, We've uh, been going out a lot more than that, so much so that we've turned our mics of the weeks into mic talk, where we're just going to kind of talk about what we've done throughout the week because we're we're kind of going all over the place. And uh, it is amazing how much better you get quicker by just going out a couple more times and doubling your stage time. It really just go, it, it ascends with the stage time how good you get. Well, it, when you guys did the four month check in. And, and I, I had, I had, you know, sent a message to Wayne right away. If you guys did it, if you guys said this is our one year check in, I would have bought it. If I, you know what I mean? The, the, the amount of y- where you guys started, which I, you guys already started at like a four month, five month level. You guys didn't go to an open mic without worked out stuff. Like, like when, when I first met you guys within the first few weeks of you doing it, I would have no idea because there's a group. I'm, I'm, I'm about 10 months in and there's a, the core group of people that we all know who's about 14 months in. That's about four to five months ahead of where I am. That's about two to three months ahead of you. I would have had you guys looped in with that group. Like if I didn't know that you guys weren't part of that group that started, you know, uh, 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 March of 2022, you know, um, cause that's where, I, that's pretty much where I had you guys pegged at. I was very surprised, but now that you're doing it more than once a week, yeah, it, it actually is super helpful. And I wish I could go out more than once a week, but you know, something that I've, I've assessed when I've come back is getting better at time management and what mics are really going to help and what I need to prioritize. And one of the things that came from now our friend Wayne, uh, Greg Bogus, he, we had a long talk one day about ambush mics. And and ambush mics are those mics where people are going out to the bar with a couple friends after work. They're going to see their girlfriend who they haven't seen in a few months. A couple of girlfriends are catching up and they walk into a bar that they've been to 10 times over the last six months. But this is the first time there's a comedy show, and they had no idea. Yeah, we've done those. I, yeah, I that that's a that's a really good point that I want to touch on. Um, before we go there, because I think that's a good place to go next. But I'll say, like you mentioned, like you would have thought that we went whatever, however further than we actually were. Anthony, I don't know if you remember this, but I don't know. It was, it was probably back in like. May when I first started doing the Pompeii masturbator bit, 
I think it was the first time I did it, and we recorded it. And I remember at the point where I got to um, this hero, and I heard Jacques laugh. I heard you laugh. <laughs> And I was so proud of myself because I had seen you and uh, me and you have had this conversation where the first time I saw you was my second time at a mic, which was at Coffee and Cotton. And I was like, man, that is a, that's an open micer. Like, that, that is a comic. That's a guy that goes out, he puts the work in, he does it. I was like, that guy's awesome. And then when I was at the safe and I did that, that joke for the first time and I heard you laugh when I said, that hero. And you have a very distinctive <laughs> laugh. Like I, I've said to Extina as well. Or Christina, however she wants to be called off stage, but you have a very distinctive laugh, and I was so pumped that you found that funny. And that was not the first time we talked. You know, it was, it was a few weeks after that when I when I first did uh, Dick Talk at the Safe, but like that that was so awesome to me. Yeah, when you're at the Safe, the, you got so cool. Jacques, you got Ian, you got Extina, and Connor a little bit, where they have incredible laughs so you're like god damn it what what do they want to talk about uh d- d- <laughs> wives i don't know what do you want shock because you just want to get the laughs yeah, from you, you, guys. you all have very distinctive <laughs>, laughs you know I, yeah. I, I, literally i'm gonna say and i mean this it's like i generally try i really i i don't like to go to a mic if i'm gonna show up a half hour 45 minutes late or if I have to leave early. And and I get it. I get everybody has things to do. You can't stay for everybody. But generally speaking, uh, and I know this sounds so cliche, I truly like to laugh. Mm. And and I, I do enjoy sitting there listening to funny people be funny. And most and I'm gonna say, let's say I've been to the safe, let's say eighteen times. I'm gonna say ten times, it was good. Three or four times, it was really good. I remember one or two times, it was eh. But there's been two or three times where I don't know if it was something in the air. I'm not into astrology, so I don't know if, you know, my head was in Uranus or what was going on. But the first person to the last person fucking killed it. And mm-hmm. and, and, and and most of the people, let's say the first eight, nine people who went up were there for the last six or seven people who were 15 people after them. There might've been like 25 people that night and everybody mm-hmm. was funny. And that's, and that's one of the things there's sometimes when, you know, I don't like going to mics anymore that you have more comics outside or in the back room talking than on the stage. And it's like, can you guys shut the fuck up? Cause this guy's being funny. Like I want to hear these funny people be funny type thing. And, uh, and yeah, it, it, it's like, I don't laugh or I don't send somebody a text message after a set or hit a friend on Instagram and say, hey, man, this was a great set. Unless it's like, I'll say, hey, man, that was a great set to anybody. You know, like, good game, good game, good game after a Little League game. But but if somebody says something that is really funny, I mean, I I would never hold back laughing. I enjoy the feeling of laughing. And so... You know, if Wayne has that joke that just strikes a nerve, it's like, and I don't even mean to do it. You know, sometimes I catch myself. I'm like, okay, settle down. Don't be distracted. Don't laugh that hard. But if I, if I find something funny, I'm fucking going to laugh. I'm not, I will, I, the day I'm too cool to laugh at an open mic or at a book show, I'm just going to stop doing it. Like, you know, I do not want to be. So we want to talk uh, at some point. So Wayne is going to lead this discussion because I don't have any social medias, but about pieces of shit at, at open mics and the discussion about it. Right, Wayne? What's going on on Facebook with those kids? Yeah. So, Jack, you you unknowingly went into my next topic. Well, it's actually my last topic, but let's let's do it now because I, I do want to hit on Mike's class. But let's do this part now. So on Facebook, um God, I, I should have looked up the mic. I think it's the Model Cafe. Yeah, yeah. Being shut down. Oh, okay. Uh, I think it was the Model Cafe. I, I, I'll make a note in the uh, the YouTube version, and I'll put it if if I'm wrong, I'll put it in the uh, the notes. But the there's a mic that's being shut down because it's it's not getting enough support. And there's been a big discussion on Facebook about whose job is it to support these mics. 
And I I see most people saying that it's it's the comics job to go there and support other comics and to support the venues and to support the bartenders. But there's a few uh, I'm going to call them cocksuckers because I I think they're wrong. There's a few people that are out there saying no the the comics should not be the ones that are responsible for keeping these mics alive. It should be the host trying to get people in there. Um, so before we get into this discussion, uh, I guess I'll put the way I'm thinking. I think we should be supporting each other as comics. So uh, me and you have had this uh, conversation outside, uh, off air, I guess I will say, where if if you're a comic that you message the host and say, hey, I'll be there at 9 o'clock, and you get there at 8.55, you go on at 9 o'clock, and you're out the door at 9.06, you're a piece of shit. Like, stay there and listen and talk, like, support your other comics. I understand wanting to go to multiple mics in a night, but that's not how this works. This isn't about you. Well, it's an interesting These discussion. open mics are not about... Because the you're right 100% because of the context of what you're talking about. It completely switches once you get to paid gigs because then you're like, hey, host, uh, I'm giving you the – you're hiring me. You're making the money off of the, the the ticket and you're paying me a set amount. You promote the fucking show. That's your job. But when it's open mics, it's a tool for all of us that we need to kind of keep alive and incubate or we don't get to use it. And as we're learning now that uh, what you guys are going to talk about, you guys did a class that went into a showcase. Once you start getting into shows like that, the open mics are – a fucking central for you to be able to work through that shit. So, I mean, what, what are you going to do? Go to an open mic, like Wayne said, be there for 10 minutes, don't buy anything, uh, don't tip the bartender well, and expect them to let you go on there and suck ass for five minutes like you do every week? No, like, we need to, like, pay for what violence we put on that stage. For sure. Yeah, exactly. So, so like, if they didn't, if, if we didn't have comics supporting this shit, the first time I ever went on stage, or the first time any of us ever went on stage, they wouldn't exist. We need people to go there, buy shit. If you don't drink, buy a soda and just fucking give the bartender a five dollar tip, ten dollar tip, twenty dollar tip, whatever. Anthony, you like you fucking tip like a motherfucker. I don't like. I'm a tipper. You you don't really drink anything, uh, but you tip like you tip so well, and that's the kind of stuff that's going to keep these things open. If you want to go to a bar and tell your stupid jokes. Because let's be honest, most of us have stupid jokes. Like we're not funny. We're not uh, at a like let's keep it local, like a Steve Bjork or a Tony V or, or what, any of the uh, Tammy Pescatelli. We're not at that level. Nobody's going to see you. So why don't you go there, spend your money, even if it's fifteen bucks, five bucks, or whatever, whatever you can afford to keep this thing going. Um, yeah, I, I've gone on too long, but like Jacques, so I, you're not so much on Facebook, but hearing what I've had to say about that, and it, it might be a little one-sided, but what are your thoughts on that? So I'll, tr I'll try to make this as quick as possible. I'm brand new. I don't know what the fuck's going on. I'm going out to Worcester once a week because those are the only mics I knew. Like, my, you know, my wife went to see a show at Ralph. She came home. I have been looking for mics. I didn't know about those groups or anything like that. I'm at this really fucking horrible mic two, three weeks in a row. Uh, but I meet a couple guys who I'm now friends with. Like, like you know, Ian e e e Matthew Sargent is one of them. And you mean Ian Michael Sargent? Ian Michael Sargent. Because <laughs> somebody Sorry, said yeah. it wrong. And, and, and so I, I'm, at, I'm at the mic. And there's like, long story short, there's... There's a couple guys. There's like a mic across town. It's this mic folded. It was called the Hitching Post. This guy Tom Sargent ran this mic. He might have. I've seen this guy. He, right. He might have six or eight guys show up as mic. But then an hour after his mic, there's a mic at Beth's across town, and that one might have fifteen people at it. But two of the three pieces of shit who would go on first at the Hitching Post are truly handing the mic back to Tom, the host, as they head for the exit so that they can be 7th or 8th at, at Beth's, opposed to 
12th to 13th. It's like, and then by the time you go up at 5th or 6th, you're literally telling a joke in front of the bartender, what, Tom Sargent, and one other person. And then you get over to Beth, and you're, you you got to wait because you're 10th once you walk in. So, you, so you're 10th out of 20th, but the guys who rushed out of the hitching post to get over there, they do the same thing. Like they do their set at the at, at best, and so it's not like oh I'm just gonna I'm gonna try to hit two mics, so I'm gonna go this. They're just pieces of shit who their stuff is so good it's worth you hearing, but they're gonna possibly have something to say that's worth making them stick around for. So yeah, I, and so one day at the safe, so I'm I'm only in it two or two three months at this point, and. I do a lot of business consulting, and one of the things that I do is I just keep my head down, shut up, which I know it's hard to believe that I can shut up, and just kind of watch. And it's funny, so the first couple months of doing open mics, I want to see how the machine works. I just kind of want to get how this whole, what is the hierarchy? How do the clicks work? How? Do, not that I want to be in a click, you know what I mean? I just That's not me, but I kind of want to figure out how the different rungs work and what it all is. And then a, a couple months in, I feel comfortable. And it was one night, it was the same couple people at different places who I noticed did this. And I posted on Instagram and it was something like, Hey, you know, if you're handing the mic back and leaving, you're a piece of shit. Also, if you're not spending at least five or 10 bucks at this place, you're also a piece of shit. That's why these mics are doing it. They're not doing it because you're so fucking good at comedy. It's a pleasure to stand here for three hours and listen to a bunch of middle-aged white guys talk about their dicks. Uh, a couple people really took it personally, as they should. I didn't name anybody, but they knew who I was talking about. And and so that 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 started quite the kerfuffle. And, and that's when I realized, you know what, Jock? This is who they are. Just stop. Just stop. You're not going to change anything. Personally, my favorite mic is the one at One Broadway Collaborative uh, on Mondays. It's my favorite mic because you do seven-minute sets, first of all. If you have a show coming up, you can say to the guy, Max, who's an absolute fucking sweetheart, hey, I got a, I got a, right, I got a gig coming up. Can I do 10? And he's going to be like, of course you can do 10. You know, I mean... I, you know, I, you know, I've talked to him about hosting. I've hosted for him before I took the class. I said, Hey, I'm taking this class. I got a, I got a paid hosting gig coming up from Jim McHugh, uh, up in Maine in a few weeks. Can I host a couple nights? And he's like, 100% you can. Uh, there's no bar. The other thing, there's no bar. So the, so you're not ordering over somebody's drinks. You're not ordering in front of a waitress. I might call that a negative. You know, well, I can. No, but but you can bring your own 100%. If you walked in can there with you? A, oh, yeah, 100%. I mean, I'll see you every week, bud. <laughs> you 100% can. You 100% can. And, and you know, it's one of those things. Bring a couple extra for everybody. I mean, I walked in with pizzas a couple weeks ago. You know what I mean? I, I, was, sure I was hungry. And I'm like, I'm starving. I haven't eaten all day. I'm stopping on the way. I'm like, yeah, I'll get an extra one so I don't be that guy. Um, so, but, <laughs> but, but, it, they're, 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 they're a nonprofit. And the video. Oh, that's the other thing. You can get a video of your set, and it sounds great. Beautifully. Sounds. Yeah. So, uh, before you go too far, I want to give Aaron. It's Aaron, right? Yeah. Yeah. I want to give Aaron a yeah round of applause because that video and audio and everything is fucking fantastic. We used it for um, our Bikaki episode. It's so good. The only thing I will say: put a mic for the audience. Right. And you know um, what? They, they, I mean, be- if if you want that, if, if if you email Max and say I'm coming Monday, can we get a mic passed around for the so I can have the feedback on my tape? They will do that. They 100 yeah. percent will do that. Let's so do every time I, I go there, every time I go there, I send ten or twenty bucks every couple times. I probably average ten bucks. So if I go two weeks in a row. I, I, I Venmo one Broadway collaborative because they have they have the codes all over the place that you can scan. If I go into the safe, I buy a Diet Coke or two. Dude, I'm not buying a two three dollar Coke and leaving two bucks on the table. Whoever is is standing next to me at the time is getting a beer or or whatever they're drinking. You know, I never go into a place without dropping like ten, fifteen, twenty bucks. Uh, if I if I went to look. 
on the nights that I laugh my ass off for two and a half hours, what movie are you going to get into and laugh for two hours and spend less than 20 bucks? And if you can't afford it, you can't afford it. I get it. You can afford five bucks. If you can afford gas money from point A to point B, you can afford a three dollar Coke and leave two bucks for the for the bartender. Um, yeah. And if if you you're in a little better position, it, go fuck yourself. That's how I feel. Right. <laughs> that's yeah, that's if you can't afford it, don't do it. Yeah, so you can't have it. That's one of the that's one of the things that I saw uh, one particular person I, I won't name, but the um they were like, yeah, I quit my job to do comedy and I can't afford that. I'm like, well, that's your own fucking stupid fault. I'm not going to quit my job to do comedy because I'm not that good at it and I have a family to fucking worry about. Well, and how would you need to, like, I would sit that person down and go, tell me why you needed to quit your job to do comedy because tell me the, the comedy that you did that was during nine to five hours <laughs> during the day. Cause I bet you didn't. Oh yeah. Well, I mean this, this particular person was like, I kill every night, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, you don't because you're not fucking Bill Burr. You're not Louis CK. You don't kill every night. You go out, you tell your jokes, your friends come out and laugh and you're not making money at it. So to, to sit there and preach, you know, supposedly preach to the choir. You're, you're not doing it. Wait, wait. Do you have Go a day on, job? So, do you have a I day job? Okay, Anthony. I do, I do you have a day job? job? I do yeah. fifty plus hours. Oh, but but you guys don't have kids, right? Oh, we have. No, I, I multiple have a kid. Kids. Oh, have two kids. Oh, yeah. oh, oh. So you have jobs, and you have kids, and you go to multiple mics a week, huh? Huh. And our wives hate us, huh. but we still do it. Wayne well, that's what I projecting mean. Projecting <laughs> his wife onto me, I, I don't know why he keeps doing that. He's like, our wives think we're not funny. I'm like, Wayne, your wife thinks you're not funny. He's like, our wives hate us. I'm like, Wayne, your wife hates you. I don't know. <laughs> like, we're not conjoined at the hips. <laughs> you could be disappointed oh, no, no, to your wife I, on your own. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Uh, but but no, when when I hear when I hear people talk about that, I mean, it's true, dude. It's like. It's look, I get it. I mean, when I was that age, when I'm early 20s, it was hard to have a stable job because my band would have a mini tour and we'd be gone three or four days this week. We wouldn't have anything. And then we pick up a college gig in Buffalo on a Saturday. Well, that paid us enough money where we could do something in like Springfield on the way, Rochester on the way, do Buffalo, hit like you know, West Seneca on the way back, like, dude, but it was hard to have a regular job. And so I had to have these stupid cobbled together, like day work jobs, you know, like, like you could call in and say, what factory am I sweeping? But that's, and, and, uh, and when I wasn't in the band, if we didn't have a gig, I literally had to balance the gig around playing minor league hockey, but I still had to pay for my own fucking car and my food. I was still an adult ish ish um but uh but yeah more of an adult than these people on facebook right now i'll tell you that <laughs> well that's the thing because it, it drives me fucking nuts listening to these fucking cucks and i like I, I don't know where these people are getting their money maybe they're living in their parents basement i'm not living i'm in a basement right now but it's my fucking basement well and i'm doing comedy and i'm working taking care of my kids and my family right and these people are out there saying well, I quit my job. Well, what do you who's who's paying for your shit? It's obviously not you. Buy a fucking beer, buy some fries, buy something and just give the bartenders something to keep the mic going because they're not going to want you there. Right. If you're not spending the money. And it's not up it, it is up to the host to get bodies in there. It, it, but it, first it, and it, foremost, it, you need to take care of yourself. But here's You're, the thing. You need to take care of your your brethren. Is it is it their job because because the thing is, I mean, as comics, how tough is it for you to get your friends to come see you more than once a one? Like, if you can't expect a host to get people in there every week, because that's just not going to happen. And if these people don't want a mic, this is what's going to happen. So, okay, don't support the mic. That's cool. Uh, you know, I, 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 look, I don't begrudge anybody. Everybody lives in their own thing. But do not come crying to me if there's fewer mics and that the mics that you that you are going to now are too crowded and you might not get up or you can't run you know you can't bully your way through cer certain mics because you don't know that person so that's the thing it's like right now there is a um look there, there, there's, there's a richness of mics i i could there 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 weren't these mics a year ago a, a year like the safe just had its year anniversary a month ago but at the safe draws 20 people every week it draws 
20 people and a few stragglers now and then who come in there. They open it up just for the mic. They close it after the mic. And if that bartender and the guy who owns the place isn't making enough money, he would shut the mic down. In fact, it's done so mm-hmm. well that when that when uh, when Concept 6 folded about two months ago, Concept 6 came to him. Oh, the, co- the kids from Concept 6 say, hey, we have this Thursday mic. Can we do it? Now the safe has two mics. And the reason there's two mics there is the Tuesday mic Mike did well enough so that the bar, because the bar owner doesn't fucking care about your comedy. He doesn't fucking care about you getting mic time. Doesn't fucking care about any of us. He cares about is he keeping his lights on? You know, can he, is there a bartender who he can call and say, hey, do you want to shift on Monday? You're going to make a couple hundred bucks. Because if they're not going to make a couple hundred bucks, they're not going to come in. So yeah. if you don't want the mics, then don't pay. But if you do want the mics, Fuck it. If you have the gas money to get there, then you fucking have five bucks to throw that wave. And if you don't, then yeah. stop doing it. The, wh- one of the things that I've seen is, is people saying, like, we don't want to see Mike's charging $5 for stage time. And it's like, then just fucking buy a Coke and leave a couple bucks. Like, stick around. Support people. So like, It's not hard to fucking support people. Like, Anthony, like, like you said, Anthony and I both have young kids. We both uh, like I work fifty plus hours. I guarantee Anthony works fifty plus hours, probably way more than me. Um, but we still go. We stay until we're on stage, and we stay for a few uh, comics after. And, and it's not just it's not just stay so the mic stays open. Stay and support your fellow comics. Give them an audience. Like we were at a mic, and I'm not going to say it. But we were at a mic a few weeks ago where at the time that we got off stage, uh, I think Anthony was up after me, there were five comics in the in the crowd. Two of them left. Yeah. So there were three comics left. Yeah. And me and Anthony stayed, and there was one comic left to go, but, you know, somebody, you know, two comics left. Dude, dude I, I, I was one of the comics there. I know, I know the mic you're talking about. And, dude... Uh, and and the and the and the comics who left, I, I, I'll be honest. Re, it, it, I don't want to say be over dramatic and say it hurt me to see them do that, but I was very disappointed. I, I was very disappointed because generally speaking, what I've noticed, and you guys can tell me this, the people who tend to be the most supportive, who hang around the longest, tend to be the better comics. Like, 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 I can tell you some of the comics that I really enjoy seeing tend to be the ones who are there early and stay late. Not always, but, but yeah. Now getting back to the paint mics. Okay. I, I didn't know that was a thing. And I just spent a couple weeks out in LA and because of a friend, not because of talent, not at all because of talent, <laughs> but, but because I have some really great friends who are just supportive, wonderful people who are, have been, have been very mentoring and supportive and they're in a position to help. And they said, Hey, if you come out, I'll throw you up on stage. And then I had a bunch of friends who said, oh, my God, when you come to town, let me know. I'm going to go to shows. And honestly, I cannot tell you how how the world lets you down every chance it gets. But that trip, the people who said, oh, I'm going to give you some stage time at great shows, gave me stage time at great shows. The people who said, oh, I'm going to drive across L.A. traffic at 6.30 on a Thursday night to see you, drove across from Manhattan Beach to North Hollywood, drove from Pasadena, uh, basically drove from Manchester to Quincy to see me at 6.30 on, on a Thursday night. You know, it's a drive that if you make at three in the morning on a Monday, it's a half hour drive. It's an hour and a half. And the fact that I had a bunch of friends who actually did that, it's like, dude, almost like welling up to the number of people who were that supportive. At the same time, the rest of the two weeks I was there, in between doing things with my kid, there's all these mics. And there's a couple places that this is all they do. They open up at 10 a.m. and they shut at midnight. And every hour on the hour, they run a paid mic where you pay five bucks to go and... The deal is you can't leave. Well, you can leave. There, you can leave, 
But when you go to sign up the next day, your name might not be able to get up on the list. You do it all online and, you know, you just, and it's fantastic because A, um, you don't have to buy anything when you get there. There's most of these places, you know, they'll, they'll, you do five minute sets. They cap it at 10 comics, you know, so you get one comic coming up, coming down. Um, and then if you want to stay and do another five minute set the next hour, there's about a five minute window where they do sell water and beer, but they only sell it before the show. Like, like, but once a, once a host introduces the next hour, you're there to watch and support that people. Now, at, at, at Monday, at like 11 o'clock, there might only be six people going up. There might only be four people. But sometimes, you know, as the afternoon goes, those places have 10 people signed up. And if you don't sign up, like first thing in the morning, at like by noon to do the 8 o'clock slot, you're not getting up. And if you time it right, and there was a couple days where I got four or five mics in at different places, and I'm going to say you would see two people at Mike two that you saw from Mike one and you would see two different people from maybe Mike one who are at Mike three. You know, there's more people doing it, but you can start at one side of Melrose and, and on a Sunday and just drive down from one end of Melrose to another and just hit five, six different mics in seven hours. Mm. And like I said, the fact that you should be buying a beer where you go in anyways, but they take that away. Like, like you let, let's not pretend that, that we're here for anything else but this. But at the same time, if you go on first, you're going to be there when the ninth person goes up. That way the ninth person is performing in front of nine people the way the first person was performing in front of nine people plus the host. And it was fantastic. It was absolutely... So there was a couple jokes that were, were brand new that by the end of the <coughs> night, I told five times, I switched it up a little each way. I tried a different setup, a different entry. I tried like a, a different aside here or there and was able to listen back and really dissect what worked and what didn't, you know, type thing. And so yeah. I'm all I'm all for it. let's not fucking play games. We're here to do this. So instead of having to buy a water, instead of having to tip somebody, just pay five bucks, but you have to be there, you know, on the hour for the hour. So if you show if you're on the six o'clock slot and you show up at six fifteen, you're not going up. You know what I mean? That that would kill a lot of uh people's game plans. Yeah, I like it. Uh, That's the open mic pay uh, podcast that we do. Mute. Oh. You know, but Mute. but right, but 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 I I like I like that whole thing that you know what I mean. So either pay five bucks to the bartender, you know, and, and there's been times when look, I I haven't had anything, and I'll just leave five bucks on the bar. What you know what I mean? And if you can't afford five bucks, you got bigger problems in your life. If you can't afford five bucks, then then you know I I do I feel for you. You know, I, yeah, I'll give you the five bucks. You know. What I mean? <laughs> but I, yeah. I, I'll give you five bucks if you sit down and you clap and you laugh for the ten people after you, you piece of shit. But it's the same people who can't. <laughs> it's the same people who can't afford five bucks for a beer. Um, are the same ones who are outside chain smoking um, in between their sets. I, I'll tell you right now: if you can't afford five bucks and you come up and talk to me, and and you're like a decent person, I'm gonna buy you a beer and I'm gonna put your tip on there for you. One hundred percent. Yeah, but like a lot of those people don't fucking care about talking to anybody. Right. So take that, you well, Facebook pieces of shit, and yeah. stop arguing <laughs> about fucking weird stuff like that. God damn. Well, boys, what do you and, say yeah. that we get down to wrapping this sucker up? Do you got a last word on the Facebook uh, shirt article? Well, we we have one more thing I want to go over real quick before. And this isn't going to be a long segment, but Jacques and I did a thing on Sunday. Uh, Mike Katrobis his uh class on hosting and and other stuff but the hosting is the big thing for me um so jacques and i did this anthony did not uh but jacques what, what did you think of that class it was, a, it was a class on 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 hosting it was a class a little bit on like crowd work i guess in, in a little bit of the sense because he he kind of threw in some variables there um, and then there, there was a little bit of, um, you know, if you're trying to get noticed by a by a booker, this is what you do, what you don't do, and all that stuff. So, what were your thoughts on that class? Because I, uh, I'd love to hear that. Uh, 
this is what I told Mike Katrobus on my way out. This is what I posted on Instagram. And this is what I have said to some other comedy friends of ours, mutual friends of ours. I feel really bad. Um, I, I feel like I stole money. I, I, I literally feel like I stole money from Mike Katrobus. Um, it was 75 bucks. And I truly feel like he tried to jam 10,000 hours of experience and a million dollars of knowledge in my $3 brain. And it's one of those things where he and I had this conversation on our podcast about, I, I have been reading a book. I, I, I went to, you know, I do want to talk about two more things. I want to talk about Mondo Comedy really quickly after this. But I went to this show, Mondo Comedy, that's every, the last Thursday every month at the Luna Theater in Lowell, post, uh, hosted by this absolute prince of a man named Greg Bogus. And I saw this legend, absolute legend, Mike Donovan. And he was selling his book, and I was reading his book. And his, and, and his book was, um, he's published a lot of books, but this book is kind of, it's like one of those old bathroom readers. You're not supposed to start from the beginning to the end. You can pick it up and read short stories anywhere. But he had this whole thing about the lost art of hosting. After I had read that book, I went to see a show with, with Steve Bjork, and the host just was not a great host. And I wasn't insulting the host when I was talking to Mike Katrobus about the show. I was saying, hey, the host wasn't great, but Mike Katrobus, I mean, um, Steve Bjork turned the, t the, the room around. And then Mike said, it's funny that you mentioned the bad hosting. And that's when he said, so many club owners and other people have been saying, hey, no, there's no good host. Everybody who hosts is a comedian who has to host or it's a comedian who and like and look most of these people who fucking started these open mics uh god bless them because they couldn't find mics on a night that fit for them and they went and they talked into a bar or a restaurant or a facility to let them do it and so uh, for all the people who started and they want to be comics they don't want to be host i don't think there's one host that we work with on a regular basis who is trying to be a great host there are some great hosts don't get me wrong but so this class was all about you're not a fucking comic you're not up here to be funny you're up here to be an mc you're not up here to do crowd work you're here to engage the crowd and interact with the crowd but there's a difference between interacting with the crowd in a hype man fashion versus so what do you do for a living sir type thing and mike really broke down the do's and the don'ts hosting is very simple but it's very hard you know what i mean it's like anybody here can play a beatles song off the first two Beatle albums with 15 minutes of practice every day for the next two weeks. Any one of us could play Please Please Me within two weeks of work. But to really play it right, to have the anchor to seize, to, to, to go. So that's what hosting is. Like, yeah, you, you can be a decent host in almost no time if you keep it simple, stupid, what you're supposed to do. But you can be a good, engaging host. You're not supposed to overshadow the comics. You're not supposed to be funnier. After the headliner's done, you don't go up and fucking tell it. And that was one of the things that I loved, Wayne, is the little bits that Mike say. You might have a fucking killer joke. But after the headliner gets off and you're saying goodnight, don't tell the joke. You do not steal the thunder from the, cause no one paid 20 bucks to come see you fucking host, Anthony. They can't pay 20 bucks to see this guy headline. So after they headline, even if your joke is fucking killer, Save it for next week. Save it for the open mic. Save it for when you're the opener. So that's what I loved. And the other thing that Mike Katrobus did, he filled a room. He got a room that was going to be filled, and he brought bookers. He brought other people who sure book did. shows that both Wayne and I talked to. And Mike didn't say, hey, I'm going to show you how to host. I'm going to show you, you know, I'm going to bring in some bookers. Part of the show, okay, I'm going to spend, he spent about two and a half hours saying, this is how you host. This is how you don't host. And every one of us got up and hosted during the show, like one by one. And he made sure if, if the third guy didn't make any of the mistakes that the first two did, he threw in a curveball and he kept doing that all yeah. day. If that was a weekly hosting class that ran four weeks, Anthony. I'd pay 75 bucks to, to go to the second, third, and fourth one. I would. But then he spends a half hour, then he spends a half hour, maybe 45 minutes saying, okay, now that we're done with the hosting, 
This is the shit that you have to do to get bookers, to get agents. These are the agents that you don't want. These are the managers that you stay away from. These are the managers that you kind of want. This is what you do to get from point A to point B. If you're at, if you're where we fucks are and you're, and we're trying to go that next step up, this is how you do it. If you're at that step, this is how you go the next rung. And, and he, Point blank, everything, Anthony. If you don't have social media and you're like me, Anthony, I, I'm only on Instagram because of my podcast. And I took it over when my buddy Joe took like a year plus hiatus. Um, I was on Twitter, but more for politics and yelling at people for being wrong about things I don't agree with. Um, Hell yes. Look, look, uh, look, I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not telling one more person on Twitter. Shut up. Christian Bale is the best Batman. Next question. Anyways, <laughs> uh, um, but, but seriously, I'm going to have to do a Facebook page. Even it just, just, I, I need a website. Wayne needs a website. You need a, and he's like, don't be cute. Don't be like, you know, Wayne likes farts.com. It's like, okay, that's a funny thing to have. And your friends at open mic are going to like that. But some booker from New York who's going to get a heads up on you from a booker from, you know, Massachusetts isn't going to think that's funny. Isn't going to think, but he gave us a yeah. roadmap. He gave us a roadmap to take that next phase. But then he introduces you to these people. He pulled me aside and says, Hey, go talk to this guy. Hey, go talk to that guy. Hey, did you shake that person's hand? Mm -hmm. And he, that's what he did with Wayne and, and Ian and a couple other of us. He made sure that we took the opportunity. And at the same time, little things like, I think if uh, everybody who doesn't have a laser pointer to sign at the next wall, I mean, what a little way, that little thing about the shining the light on the back wall versus waving your phone. That, that was, was nice. so yeah. much better. Yeah, that was nice. Right? And, and that was way better. I, 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 I mean, and, and, and Anthony. Except for that one guy that went like 15 minutes over, he must have been blinded by the time he left. Oh, seriously. Like, like <laughs> and, and the funny thing. Right after you left, Anthony, either that guy was on stage for like nine minutes and Mike was just like get the fuck off the stage And then he started and then he started walking up to the stage. Like he finally he, he finally and, and during the hosting thing, people asked, What do you do? And he goes, I do this. This is step one. This is step two. This is step three. And then after that I start making my way to the stage. And step five is I just start clapping from the audience saying, okay, yeah. let's hear for Anthony Eugenio, everybody. And you're still in the middle of a joke, you know? Uh, yeah. But. And he was real close. Like, that was, that was ridiculous. Yeah, it sounds but, like but, that was an invaluable class. So, I, I, did he say he's going to do more of these uh, or something like that? Because this should be something that we promote if he does. He, he does. The other thing that he does, he does comedy classes. And he also does intro to comedy Phase two of comedy and the same thing. There's a showcase at the end that he packs with people. He will bring people to your show. Of course you, so if there's, if there's 20 people who take a class and everybody brings one or two people because they're beginning or they're taking the next step, you know, you got 40 people in the room already. He'll get the other 20 people in there. There was at least 60 people in that room. And it was, it was such a great night. Uh, so like I said, so I really want to touch uh, on Greg Bogus. So. Greg Bogus runs Mondo Comedy. It's the last Thursday at the Luna Theater in Lowell. It's the nicest place in, in the Merrimack Valley to do comedy. He brings in a legend every time. It is. It's Steve Bjork. It's Mike Katrobis. It's, it's, you know, uh, Mike Donovan. It's Tony Steve v. Sweeney. It's Tony V. Yeah. The fact that I've done three book shows with him and I've opened up for Tony V and Mike Donovan and, and uh, Mike Katrobis, it's ridiculous. And that's something else. He, every show, holds one or two spots for some schmuck like me, some pissant like you, some, some dumb guy like Wayne. It's like literally he gives all of us a shot. And... And it's been that way since he's been hosting this thing for seven years. I've met so many people doing comedy now who their first book gig was through him. I, I literally, I, I've met no less than 50 people. And now just, just in our small pool of people, there's been five or six of us who, who've, who've done it. And like I said, like Wayne was able to go and I said, Hey, get there early. Cause I want you to shake his hand and see him. And then I will follow up and say, Hey, and there's a couple other people that I have a really great rapport with him because 
you know, I, I've gone to so many shows. It's the one show that's three miles from my house. Mm. It literally is right down the street. It's a great venue. I usually go with my, you know, my podcast partner, Joe. Uh, lots of times my wife can make it, but sometimes I bring two or three people. It's always a great show. Uh, it's all, it is. It's always a great show. Greg has been on my podcast. Um, he's also given me so much great advice. On, on different things in and outside of comedy. When I do his shows, you know, the last time I did a show, I brought the Lowell Sun reporter to interview him and to cover the show. I'm friends with the people at the local radio station, which doesn't mean shit, except every time I go on the radio station to promote one of the shows I'm on, three or four people from the station come to support. You know, mm-hmm. I got the mayor from Lowell to go to my last show there. So, so Greg is so supportive. And that's why I was so glad that Wayne was able to get there and actually not just, hey, this is my friend Wayne, but actually engage and talk because that's the next level is all about who you know. Mm. You know, we're we're all fighting for those very few hosting and opening slots, those seven minute slots at a Knights of Columbus gig, you know, where it's a, a fundraiser for a Bill Ricker Bill Ricker youth softball. And they hire Mike Katrobus's production company to come in with a host a headliner, a middle, and an opening comic, and we're all trying to get those open comic gigs, and those are going to go to the people that Mike knows, and the people who Wayne and I met after the class who booked these shows, and stuff like that. So, taking those hosting classes, you know, it's 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 different than doing stand-up. It's not a stand-up class. It's actually don't come up here and be funny. Come up here and be likable, be charming, get the crowd pumped up, and get the funny people on, and get out of the way. You know, and and that's the that's what a host at those real shows do. Well, I got two things on my list for uh, now because I'm gonna have to do this fucking class because Wayne uh, won't let me uh, not do the next one, and I got to go to Mondo Comedy with you on the next one we go to as well. So right, both of those things are gonna happen now for me because I feel so fucking left out for the last. 35 minutes of this podcast i'm like oh you guys had a great time how you did i was changing eight diapers that's what i did you guys saw tony v i uh changed eight diapers and anthony uh, i would i would trade places i would play trade places in a second like i literally am so jealous of you i'm not kidding i mean I, I I never I held, wouldn't no, fuck shitty diapers. I never ever <laughs> I, I never ever held a baby till we had one and when I say every feeding at three in the morning, every diaper change on the tee, but you know, and I don't know if your little bastards do this. One of my kids would only shit in a clean diaper. Would only sh- oh, my kids were bastards. Like literally, we didn't get married. <laughs> we didn't get married till we were seven and four. Oh, snows like we would. Day, you know? Yeah, no, we we were together for a long time. And we just weren't going to get married, and we want to have kids. And but then she took a job in Qatar, and you can't live together unless you're married. Mm. And so we got married. So we got literally. We walked down to the beach. I was dressed as Han Solo. The oldest one was dressed as Nightwing. The other one was dressed as Robin. And you, you had to be careful uh, mentioning Han Solo. Anthony's going to get hard. He's going to knock his microphone off the stand. Like, like, like be- literally, uh, my, <laughs> my, my. my <laughs> My my best man, my best man wore uh, wore Bobby Orr's uh, Oshawa General Junior A uniform. The Biff, who's my co-host, was a Jedi Master. I dressed as Han Solo. Ooh. My wife, you know, fucked it up. She wore a regular, not you know, a, a regular nice dress. And, but the boys were in their favorite superhero outfits. Uh, one friend dressed as Darth Vader. Uh, one friend dressed as Batman. And that's, that's, we just walked, we lived, we literally lived four houses from the beach. Wow. And well, we just walked uh, down. Before we get, I, I had to ask you before, because you just mentioned Star Wars, and I, I got to get this out. What's your favorite Star Wars movie? Which one? What's the best one? What's your favorite? It, it, it's, it, it's Empire Strikes. It, it, it was Empire Strikes Back. It might be Rogue One. Wow. It might be Rogue One. You ready for yeah, this? Yeah, I, re- I, I really love Rogue One. I want to say, everybody says Empire Strikes Back, and I get it. That is the best movie that they made out of all of them, uh, empirically. And Rogue One, uh, you know, cinematically, has got to be close to that quality as well, especially the Vader scene at the end. God damn. But my favorite Star Wars movie is Revenge of the Sith. What do you th- is that? Do you cringe when I say that? That's my... That's no! Mine. Look, I... And, and, and this, this, is, this is the honest truth. I love them all. 
I, I literally love absolute. Yeah, there's flaws in everything. Look, aside from Star Wars, probably my favorite non Batman, non you know MCU Star Wars movie of all time is Pacific Rim, and there's one flaw in it that is so huge and so fucking stupid, but I love the movie so much. You know what I mean? So I overlook all that. And it's I've had, I've had this discussion with my sons. It's like, you, you know, whoever your Batman was when you were 12, that's your Batman. Yeah, like, when you start yeah. going to movies, and so I'm 12 years old. It's the first summer that I, look, you know, I, I grew up without a dad, so we were kind of on our own because mom had two jobs. But when I was 12 was the first time my mom would let me and my buddy take a cab because it was like three bucks to go from Wilmington to the Woburn Cinema. And we would see Star Wars, we would see Empire Strikes Back four or five times a day that mm. entire summer. And, and, and so that's why that movie, plus it's, it's the one movie that I got to have dinner with the director for like three hours and just talk about it wow. and 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 here's the and this was his favorite this was his favorite part about the movie himself when lucas redid everything where technology changed he only changed three shots in empire strikes back and the shots were in cloud city when they were walking down a hallway in the window they now they now he added the window so yeah. you could see things outside. He didn't change anything totally. Story added a scene, deleted a scene, put in a character. All he did was add window shots on Cloud City, and that was you know that was the director's like oh you know. But all of it, it's like look, like 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 Andor, the last big Star Wars you know series that came out. Dude, did you like Andor? Did you watch all that shit? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I liked it. Okay, dude. They never mentioned the word Jedi. No. They never mentioned lightsabers. So you had this eight episode absolute fucking awesome series that don't mention Jedi's or lightsabers. How fucking deep is that well? So, uh, but Ahsoka, uh, if you, if you, uh, in my office, I have, I'll bring it on over. I have my, uh, but I do my 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 fridge is but my my favorite Star Wars book is this Ahsoka book. Oh, the Ahsoka action figure. Jesus, the Ahsoka Lego. There's a bunch of other Ahsokas all over this place. Is yeah, the Ahsoka book Rebels Tano. Ahsoka uh, level or is it Clone Wars Ahsoka? No, no, it's between that. Oh, it's but it, it right. Right, it's between that. So she, at the very end of the book, is when she she kind of um oh what's his fucking name? Princess Leia's father. Um, not Bail, not Anakin. Bail Organa. Yeah, Bail Bail Organa. Bail Organa. She ends up like running into Bail Organa, who's then like, hey, we know what you've been doing. There's a lot more going on that you don't know about. Mm. I, I I got some people you got to meet. So it takes place in between. T- the book came out before Rebels did, before the series Rebels did. Uh, but yeah, she's just, uh, she's just a badass. I, I never once had to imagine what I thought two people who would have to pretend to draw what they thought a vagina looked like. <laughs> <laughs> More so than now, and I'm looking at them in person. <laughs> well, it's amazing. It, it, well, and and and, 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 now, and now here's the most fucked up thing. So, my my wife is in uh, Ronald Reagan uh, Hospital, U- UCLA Medical Center, Ronald Reagan Hospital, in Westward, California. She's given birth to our son, and we knew the first name. And the middle name was going to be Danger for like nine months. It was going to be Danger, and my wife as we were driving to the hospital says okay a deal's a deal i'm fine with it because she gave the middle name to our first son she played the oh i'm gonna give our son the middle name of my dead dad cart what a fucking bitch Jesus and anyways Christ. so the so the so the <laughs> <laughs> right oh boo hoo. so i get to give the second name so the first kid was always going to be named luke there was no doubt about it. My first son was going to be named Luke. I end up marrying a woman who, like my Hyundai Santa Fe, was made in Korea. So we don't go with Luke because he's not going to have blonde hair and blue eyes. You know, it's Luke. Uh, so, so, <laughs> so that's why we went with we, we not Chinese, he's Korean. <laughs> <Sorry>. uh, <laughs> I couldn't. It was but, right uh, there. I had to grab it. <laughs> it was right. No, it's left hanging fruit. But um. Uh, 
But he, uh, so we went with Ruth Grayson, who's my favorite superhero, is Nightwing, Dick Grayson. So, yeah. the, so the second son, we, we knew the first name. Uh, we, we have this movie called Stardust. She's nine months pregnant with the first son, and we see this movie Stardust, and the main character is named Tristan. And I'm like, holy shit, I love that name. And my wife's like, oh my God, I've always loved that name, but in a million years, I didn't think you would like that. So I'm like, nope. She's like, are you rethinking Grayson? I'm like, Slow your roll, lady. It's like, you know, <laughs> I said, but if we're going to have a second kid, it will be Tiberius, uh, Tristan. And so she's pregnant. She's in the hospital. Uh, you know, she had the baby. Um, I go home I, to get a change of clothes. It was a long thing. It was like one of those, you know, 28 hour things. Saying, wah, wah. Um, and, and what was really, what was really tough about that day is, whew, oh. it's even hard to talk about. Um, uh, the Bruins were up three games to none against the Philadelphia Flyers, <laughs> oh. and that's and that's when the Bruins, yeah. that's when the Bruins like literally lost four games in a row to the Flyers. And yeah. so that the day he was born, May first, two thousand ten, was the game four to the Flyers. Um, wow! So, fuck your kid, man. So, I remember that day so bad. That right? Was the worst. So, <laughs> God damn. so. So, so, Sorry, you know, it's like, like you know, on fucking the day that Hiroshima dropped. That's a bad day. Right? Seriously. <laughs> I mean, it, so I go, I go that home. That was the bomb. Uh, <laughs> I go home and. Jacques, and, we have a vacancy on our podcast. Would you like to fill it out? <laughs> <laughs> He's fucking done. Well, welcome to the open mic Star Wars thing. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I, I go home. And I'm like, she's so on the way, on the way to the hospital, she says, okay, we can give him the middle name danger, but you have to promise you're not going to spend the next 50 years telling everybody in the world, ask me what his middle name is. Ask me what his middle name is. It's like, of course I'm going to do that. And so I couldn't make that promise. So I said, okay, I'll come up with another name. I drive home and I still have the notebook and, and, my, and the whole drive home, I'm writing names and I'm like, Han, Chewy, Solo, Falcon, you know what no, I mean. Please name your kid Chewy. All, please all, all just these... go bang your wife right now. Make so, another kid name it Chewy. Oh, oh, <laughs> so oh, look at one of her lightsabers fell off. Okay, gotta fix this. Hold on. All right. <laughs> so, 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 so I go home. The movie Star Trek had just come out on Blu-ray. The 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 reboot with with J.J. Abrams, mm. and there's a scene. It is my favorite scene in the movie where. Um, you know, young Kirk drives his stepfather's car off the cliff, if you know it. And like, there's a RoboCop character who like, is, he's in the dirt. He's getting up. He almost died over the cliff. Sabotage by the Beastie Boys is playing. And the, the futuristic RoboCop's like, citizen, what's your name? And so defiantly, he's like, James Tiberius Kirk. I get back to the hospital. And the next morning when the lady comes in, is like, do we have a name yet? Um, I didn't even tell my wife. And I look right at the nurse. I look at my wife. I say, Tristan Tiberius Lambert. And this is why I love this woman. She says to me, <laughs> you named it after a Star Trek captain and it wasn't Picard? <laughs> and I'm like... <laughs> and so as much as I love Star Wars, I love Star Trek. As much as I live and have a bunch of Batman tattoos and my son's name Grayson, I love Marvel comics just as much. And luckily she does too. And that's why it fucking works. Do do you are you familiar with Brian Hussein? Oh yeah, yeah. Do uh, do you know his joke where he he? Uh, I don't know exactly how it goes, but <laughs> yeah, he does a joke where he's like, "I like to drive by the Star Wars lines at the theater and just yell out my window, Star Trek sucks," <laughs> <laughs> and just watch all the geeks fucking like well, freak out. I I I, I mean <laughs> I, I I think it was like. Was it was it when the Force Awakens? You know, maybe it was Return of the Sith. You know, came out. Uh, Triumph, the insult comic, is is <laughs> is walking, is interviewing people in the line, and here comes a guy dressed as Spock, just walking down. The people are in line, and he's just walking by all of them, and and the most. <laughs> Spock like it's like like manner ever. No, but I do. <laughs> I mean, I mean, seriously, as much as half my clothes are Star Wars, if I can lose this hundred pounds I put back on, I do. I, I have, I have, uh, all, all the jerseys from Star Wars and Star Trek I have. Like, also, I don't want to brag, uh, 
I do have a flight suit from Battlestar Galactic. Cause so I love it all. Like I live the fact that, and it fucks people up because the, the things that fuck people up the most, it's like, how is a fat guy who fights all the time, a vegetarian like that? People are surprised that uh, I'm a vegetarian since 1989. And the other thing that surprises people is like, how can somebody who does MMA absolutely know so much about Battlestar Galactica? And to that, I say, the 1976 version or the reboot in, in 98 because what i like about this one no i am the world's biggest like like child child you will ever meet but you can throw and bears, fuck a motherfucker up bears beats battle star galactica, galactica. That's right. and <laughs> you know and it's funny and, and it's like uh, no, it, it it it's just great. It's absolute. I I and I do. I, people are like always surprised. That it's like I'm a nice guy, but dude, I have the most charmed existence I know. I literally have the most supportive wife in the world who is like she feel you know I, I one of the big, well I started doing this because we were supposed to move back to L A. I I took a job in L A. and February first I agreed to a job in L A. that I was going to start when I got back from three military tours that I had lined up and 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 March April and May and COVID hit and then by the time COVID's done. It's like our kids ready for high school, and we made the we made the decision. We can't do it. We cannot move as he's going into high school. That would just be too cruel to him. Mm-hmm. And so I, I said, you know, so I spent the I spent the first year writing a script that I sold that I'm I'm very happy with that I absolutely, um, but it killed me. Like that's where I literally put on probably 75, 80 pounds in a course like six months writing it, and then after that was done, I'm like. Okay, what's next? It's like, well, I might be doing some more military tours. I might have to host him, and 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 maybe I'll do a comic tour, and I put some comic together, and maybe I'll do it too. So I better get back into comedy. And so this is when I when I joke about this being nothing more than a midlife crisis. Uh, but my wife, you know, she she travels and she has her stuff, and I'm I, I love I love people are people are like, oh my god, I can't believe your wife travels around the world and sees Duran Duran. It's like. Nothing makes I don't know anybody who's happier doing their thing than she is doing that. And she also takes her boys. Like like she she took one kid to to uh Dublin recently to see a show and they were there for a week. She just took one to um to uh New Orleans, you know, and, and they stayed a week down in New Orleans and he got to experience like Fat Tuesday and all that stuff. Um yeah, no. So, so and the same thing with me. It's like if I if I do a work thing and and I've worked for the NFL and NASCAR and I've done and I've taken the boys to all this stuff, you know, just because you know the only thing better than traveling is getting paid to travel. But we do. We're just my little guys now into European, you know, football. So we we, we find out last minute that Manchester United is playing Arsenal. So we just drove five hours to New York, slept in the car, got up. Went to the ticket office, went to the game, drive five hours back. When we were in L.A., he finds out Barcelona is playing Milan. Same thing. We drive the four and a half hours to Vegas, sleep in the car, go to the game. I actually checked into a hotel just to grab a shower because it was so humid and gross. It's like, no, I need to take a shower and take a nap before we drive back, buddy. Um, but we just do that stuff all the time, Dad you know, the and year. it's like, no, no. It's like, look, I mean, I mean. And, and you guys know this. I mean, you, you guys are a little younger than mine, but it's it's the things that are important to you become less important, and the things that are important to them become you push the chips and go all in. The fact okay. that even my sons are really supportive of this, you know, uh, and it's funny because, <laughs> you know, I I, 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 I I talked about it like last week. A UPS guy was dropping off a few weeks ago, and he got out of his van. And he's like, you got any jokes for me? And I'm like, what? He goes, weren't you in the newspaper? And my 13-year-old was standing right there. And the look of dread, he's like, oh, fuck. We're never going to hear the end of it. Like right away, he's like, oh, fuck this. You know? And he, and he, he, he did it kind of sane. Those were the exact words out out of his mouth it's like, oh fuck this uh, but 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 that's the thing it's like the things that are, so that's why i can't go to as many mics now because the oldest one is now in high school and he has some plays coming up he does theater he does he wants to join an improv thing he's done stand-up which me which is great the other guy now plays on two soccer teams and i'm not missing and dude 
Fuck it. You know what? Where, what am I doing? I'm not getting a Netflix special. You know, I, I have a methodical plan where I want to be in six months from now, a year from now, and five years from now. I, I have a roadmap and, and, and those, those aren't really, it's like, uh, uh, I failed if I didn't meet them, but I have to set benchmarks for myself. Yeah. Hey, but, well, we're going to remora eel on you that whole way through the five years because we, uh, love what you're doing. Because you are running the – let's talk about all your superlatives before we wrap this thing up. So we have Carnival Personnel Podcast, right? Where, are, where, you got shows coming up soon too that you, we should play? The, the, only, the only one that I have that, that I'm, I'm, I care about and I'm really working on uh, – oh, fuck. C – Sanford. Sanford, Maine. Oh, near me. At That's Sm- my sister lives there. At Smitty's. Uh, October 13th, I'm hosting for Jim McKay. Uh, Jim McHugh. Jim McHugh, who's on the podcast, he's another guy that I got to open for hey. at Luna. And he's like, yeah, do you want to host? I'll give you a hosting gig. Oh, I live in so, Maine, Josh. Is it- I, I do got a uh, – maybe I'll go to that one. I'd love to meet that guy. That'd be cool. Oh, dude, he's a fu- he's that? a monster. It- he is a fuck. What day is that? It- it's a, is it's that a Friday that? night. It's a Friday night. That's a Friday night? October 13th. Yeah, and, and honestly – Put me on that shit. I'll yeah. sleep at my sister's house. I don't give a fuck. No, I mean, house, right? it, it, I, I mean, <laughs> but but before we go, a bit, before we sign, before we move on, guys, I I literally I've said this to your face in person. I've said it on my podcast. First of all, as comics, I really, really thoroughly enjoy your styles, your senses of humor, uh, and, and your development. I am a fan of your podcast. I think the the favorite my favorite arc on anything I've listened to podcast wise um is when you guys developed the be cocky joke and and you both did your different things. Uh Anthony, your description of your humor versus Wayne's humor, I literally it hurt. It absolutely side splitting hurt. Like whether you're talking about UFOs, whether you're talking about joke stealing, whether you're talking about this mic or this host, what you guys do is absolutely brilliant and you're funny and and I, I love everything about Open My Pain and I, I really enjoy you two as people and as comics. And thank you so much for letting me monopolize your fucking show because I you know. we we truly appreciate that. And before we wrap this up, it's gonna be a quick one. Are you ready? Oh, you said Who's that funnier? last time and Anthony you went forty five minutes. Oh. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Don't answer that. I don't want Anthony to be hurt. <laughs> I'm just fucking around. But no, well, we, we, well, the thing is, Wayne, you're definitely funnier, but I steal more jokes from Anthony. So, so your so, so your presentation and your delivery is great, but but he writes better stuff, and he's who I steal from. It, so it's hard. It's hard to replicate that out of breath from talking uh, thing. No. You know? <laughs> but I did. I love how you guys went in different directions, and it was like, wow! It was, it was so fun watching you develop the same. Here's the premise, and this is where you took it. This is where you took it. You both punched up each other's stuff, and it's just that whole well, process was so much fun. Well, I punched up Anthony's stuff. He gave me nothing. That cuck. Uh, uh, Sorry, no, I was all running me. a little short on <laughs> jizzing on dog face material. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, but 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 he did, Wayne, because when you pitched something that didn't work for him, and he said, "No, that works for you." With that, he basically gave you the whole the whole license to say, "No, it's not my joke. It's our joke. You go do this." So in a way, he mm. did give you. You know, the, you know, so you're the, the cuck. The whole, I fuck your license. wife, Wayne. See, fuck don't, you. Don't make him feel better. Don't make him feel better. <laughs> fuck him, uh, dude. He's still on diaper duty. I mean, come on, come on. Throw him a bone here. Throw, you know, throw. And also, I suppose. Throw, throw, throw. And also, I'll say again, Love my you, banner Anthony. is straight, and Wayne's is crooked. So fuck him. He can't handle a basic task that a kid can handle. And with oh, that, which being said, <laughs> which which ones which which okay the best TV show in the history of television is of course Ted Lasso and the whole storyline about the belief poster being crooked so maybe 
maybe he's paying homage to that. <laughs> or maybe he's just an artist. You know, maybe he just sees the world different than you. Maybe you see it so straight and, 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 and everything perpendicular and, yeah. and even points. And I, Wayne just looks at it with a comic's eye. Oh, well, I'll say I'm this, Jaco. I am all about all the letters. You see the world straight, I'm about all the other letters, all right? <laughs> Fuck yourself. And also, I can guarantee you, now I don't know the answer to this question, but I do know uh, that that tub of shit over there has never seen Ted Lasso. <laughs> Say it, Wayne! Wow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I knew it. He's got the taste of fucking Jared from Subway. That is Wayne's taste right there. He likes that sweet well, onion chicken teriyaki so and children's sandwich. I will say, I will say, I am too busy editing this beautiful show that we have going on. Oh, shit. To, it is. It's a lot of work. It is a lot of work. I'm too busy editing this to watch Ted Lasso, so I'm missing out on life. I'm going to die very upset, and it's all because of you, and I hope you know that. And a when I'm on my small deathbed. penis, and that's the beginning of the show and the end of the show, everybody. <laughs> so give it up, and that's another step for the quest for laughs, motherfuckers. Good night. Went, oh my god, this thing sells gross. I gotta wash it. And I went, Wayne wore that. And she gagged. She went, oh. she went.